Heavenly Father, we're thankful again that we can, that we have access into your presence guaranteed by the finished work of Christ and that we're privileged to just study together here in this particular format. Privileged to feast upon your precious word as the infinite word of the sovereign God. And as we approach it, may we realize that we are looking at that which you have given us May the Holy Spirit be our only teacher, stripping away all the foolishness but sealing truth to our hearts. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together, continuing on in our study in the epistle to Titus, verse by verse. Uh, I believe in our last study together, we got down to verse 11. In verse 9, uh, we saw holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the, the teaching or the doctrine. The word there is doctrine. So that he will be able to both uh, to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. In Timothy, we're told to uh, teach doctrine. For in so doing, we will save or deliver ourselves and them that hear us. Verse 10, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And, and in my last video, I touched on that subject just a bit. I pointed out how that circumcision uh, for us today is of the heart uh, through spiritual baptism uh, which is in contrast to law. Legalism, uh, sound doctrine, exhorts and convinces. And one doesn't do that by personal or through personal experiences. Uh, I'd rather hear one word from the Word of God than to stand in front of someone all day long listening to their experiences. True exhortation and, and true convincing, convicting in the things of the Spirit is done through doctrine. And folks, that's not too popular today. Now, I'm not, by any means, I'm not at all suggesting that there may not be some emotion connected with your relationship to Christ. I'm sure there is and there should be. I think that's great. But the basis of that relationship is not emotion, it's intellect. It is what God has done for us, which we have all appropriated through the Spirit that was given to us by God Almighty, and we need to know that. And we don't come to know that through experience. So we believe the truth of His Word, and it's that doctrine, that truth, which will exhort and convince those who contradict. There is power in the blood, just as the song says, there's also power in the Word. And, of course, we know who our teacher is. I don't, I've told you folks, I don't teach you anything. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts you, convinces you, teaches you, and that through His Word. And if it's not His Word, there's nothing there for, for the Holy Spirit to work. This, this is why I always mention in my prayer that he would take and filter out all the foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth. So it's what God has done for us. That's what we need to know. There's some argument uh, among Bible teachers in the ninth verse whether the, the, these gainsayers are Christians or not, and I'll use the word I'll use the word Christian as as as, uh, as someone who belongs to God. It seems that if they're going to be exhorted and convinced, they must be God's children, 
And I think that we need to realize that as well. That here the Holy Spirit is clearly pointing out that, it, that if I am by sound doctrine able to convince and ex exhort someone, well, I've got one of two possibilities. Either he's con convinced and exhorted and he's still an unbeliever, but he doesn't talk, he doesn't talk back, he doesn't contradict anymore. Or, it, or he's a Christian, he's one who belongs to God and is now exhorted and, and convicted, convinced. And I take the latter position. Now you don't have to, but it seems to me verse 9 is talking about those who belong to God and, and yet who are, are, are arguing, uh, talking back against sound doctrine, contradicting sound doctrine and biblical truth. And I believe that there are great numbers of those people I examine myself regularly to, to decide whether I'm one of those. Folks, I, I surely don't want to be found arguing against the truth of the Word of God or lying against the truth. I don't believe that we should handle this book deceitfully. So I look at the ninth verse as saying that when a subject comes up, the discussion is based on the truth of the Word of God, not the, the opinions of men, you know, like, well, I think, you know, or I feel. And, and verse 10 goes on and points out that there are many, in fact, the language would indicate that, that these are the majority. It wouldn't strain the text at all, folks, to say that most are unruly and empty talkers and deceivers, particularly the Jews, the Judaizers the legalizers. Now, I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to be accused of any racism here. The Word of God is saying that legalism is the primary basis of this object, uh, this contradicting discussion, this, 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 uh, this opposing talk, just as is circumcision. Any number of people who have studied church growth and church success have found out that legalism leads to, to gr actually, believe it or not, legalism leads to growth, dynamic uh, growth in numbers, uh, financial strength, and, and so forth. And the church that isn't legalistic, well, just may not grow at all. In fact, it may cease being a church. And there's all kinds of articles written to ministers on the strict legal direction of a church and, and the law that's held over the heads of the people. And these are the churches that grow. And here we are told in Titus that it's the legalism. And by circumcision there, I don't, I don't think I'm pushing the text to suggest that the root cause of most of this empty talk and resistance to sound doctrine is based on biblical law. Not civil law, but biblical law. Okay? Sounds great. I mean, stop and think about it for a minute, folks. It's difficult to convince someone that we're not under law when Scripture is full of biblical law. Okay? It, it just seems that so few Christians, especially nowadays, are willing to admit what Scripture says, and that is that we have died to the law in order that we might live unto God. We're told in verse 11 that this kind of language must be stopped. Okay? It's a present active infinitive, which says that it isn't something that, that's done once and for all, and well, and that, and that just that, that finishes it. It is a constant battle, and I'm going to suggest to you that the activity of the flesh, particularly among those who go to church, is legalism. And so there's a huge battle in this area. The present active infinitive indicates that this isn't something that's going to, 
you know, well, we stopped that day. That's, that's taken care of. You know, we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's a constant, ongoing conflict. In fact, I've often suggested how that ministry, at least from a personal perspective, I'll tell you that my ministry, my personal ministry for the past 30 some odd years, has been mostly polemical. And I want you to notice that it says that, the, that this kind of teaching subverts whole houses. Whole houses. I'm sure every one of you are familiar with the, the phrase, the house of God. If you step into a church, you know, you're stepping into the house of God. Of course, we know early Christians met in homes. So I think that the, the underlying feeling behind the statement there in the Word is, is that what the, the thought that the Holy Spirit's trying to convey is that whole entire congregations, whole entire ministries, whole entire churches, whether you know brick and mortar or otherwise, can be subverted. And that's what we see today. Whole families teaching things which they ought not to teach. And one of the primary motives for so doing, according to our text, is greed money, growth, and success. And here we're told that the primary motive for this kind of teaching is filthy lucre or greed. And folks, I, you know, this particular channel, this Blessed Hope Forever, you know, we, we have certain principles. We also have certain scruples, but my primary interest, folks, is, is, in, is focusing on what does this book say? And that, despite or regardless of, the, of popular, the popular consensus. And we don't need to use bait and guile and deceit on this channel for views or followers or subs or anything else. We don't need to conduct the teaching of the Word of God in such a way that it promotes growth and money and, and success, uh, ad revenue, or any of, the, any of the, the drives that are common in the business world, okay? That is not what this channel is about at all. It's an activity which, which the, the serious, honest, the true student of the Word, and in, in particular, in, in this in this present context, the leaders in the fellowship must be constantly aware of and they must be constantly active in this conversation against the ones who contradict, the ones who resist the truth, argue against the truth, lie against the truth. And the word circumcision there leads me to believe that that's primarily legalism. It's hard to, not to argue against that fact. We're looking at legalism. Plain and simple. We'll look at it in verse 14, Jewish fables and commandments of men. One of themselves, uh, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now, verse 12 tells us that a Christian said, and, and, and of course, uh, there's, well, there's a lot of people that believe that that's, that was, uh, uh, many of the commentators, in fact, will say, suggest that that was uh, Epimenides. I don't know whether that's who it was or not. It's not to me, it's not important. The Holy Spirit didn't seem uh, too interested in revealing the name of this person. One of them, a prophet, that is someone inspired by God to foretell the truth, the Word of God. I think the Holy Spirit is saying by what he said, he performed the function of a prophet. That's the word in the, in the Greek text, prophet. That is, he told the truth. And he said, Cretans are always liars. Now, that's, that's, that's interesting that a Cretan 
would say that Christians are always liars. I mean, talk about a talk about a confession. It, it it would leave us with the possibility that we don't know whether this is true or not. He kind of stopped me and dead in my tracks. I had to think about this for a minute. If Christians are always liars, and a Christian says all Christians are liars, well, is he lying? And we have, of course, we have the following verse that says, this testimony is true. This testimony is true. Now, I spend a lot of time looking at the grammar, looking at, uh, in this case, looking at the cases in Greek grammar. And I've come to the conclusion based on the fact that the word testimony or witness is in the nominative case, that when verse 13 says this witness is true, what what it's saying is it's saying that uh, what verse 13 is saying is not that one of theirs said this, but that what he said is true. So here's one who is always a liar who spoke the truth. And for that reason, the word prophet occurs in verse 12. And the word witness in verse 13 refers to what he said, not to the fact that he said it. So I have to reach the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is telling us that what this Christian said was in fact true, and what he said was that all Christians are liars. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go down to the to the shore here. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get in in my boat and I'm gonna go out. Uh, I'm gonna go fishing, and the guy doesn't go fishing. That's a lie. And do you honestly think that's what the text is talking about, folks? I, I can't help but read that as biblical liars, okay? I'll come back to that thought in a minute. But And then we have evil beasts, meaning rude, from a biblical standpoint. Point, uh, rude with respect to biblical truth. They, they were interested only in that which pleased them. Slow bellies. Now you could translate that. Uh, literally translated idle stomachs and um, you know you can come to any conclusion that you want I reached the conclusion that what that means is that they're not active at all in the study of God's Word that's how I'm reading that they're not active at all in anything that is godly or directed toward God they're only interested in that which pleases themselves that which satisf satisfies their own personal, uh, their own personal appetite. Now Titus is on the Isle of Crete, and he's ministering to these people, and the Holy Spirit is saying that what one of those people said about Christians is true. And I think that. I think the primary truth that we're concerned about in this context is their biblical activity, as, as we'll see in the next verse. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. I would, I would translate that, cut them off abruptly. Don't give them a platform in the fellowship for this kind of activity. In order that they may be, be, become healthy, in the faith okay healthy in the faith and once again it appears at least to me it, it appears as though the context is speaking of God's elect on the Isle of Crete now you have to back up and think about this for a moment folks here's Titus okay he wasn't a Jew here he was led by Paul or, or associated with Paul they came to the Isle of Crete Paul is now told, or we are told by the Holy Spirit, that Paul left him behind for a temporary period of time to set up leaders in the fellowship. And what kind of fellowship was it? Well, if I look at these verses, it seems to me that Titus, Titus may have thought, well, you know, there aren't any believers here. There aren't any Christians here. Look at, look at the people that I've got to minister to. Bunch of liars. 
you know, there were, uh, there were two kings in Israel. One was David, you know, David, King David, the, the George Washington of Israel, great king. And then, you know, and then you got this other king, Ahab, you know, and nobody ever, I don't, I don't think aggravated God any more than Jezebel, who was Ahab's wife. So it's interesting to look at these two. Ahab is one of the few people, I believe, in the Bible that we can, we can be pretty sure that he was the son of the devil. I mean, without any doubt, David was a child of God. You know, he's followed me in all of his ways, except in the case of Uriah. What did David do? Well, he, he looked at something, he wanted it, and he took it. And in, in order to possess it, he had to commit premeditated murder. Well, what did, I, what did I, Ahab, what, what did he do? Well, interestingly, he looked at something that he wanted, and in order to possess it, he had to commit premeditated murder. Well, that's interesting. You know, that they both did the same thing. I, I challenge you to find any difference in the activity of either one of those two in getting what they wanted, and yet the Word of God in the case of Ahab leads, leads us almost to the absolute conclusion that he was a son of the devil, and the Word of God says that David followed him in all of his ways, except in the case of Uriah. In many ways, looking at those who belong to God and those who don't, we can see, you know, uh, that there's not much difference. We can't, we can't see any difference. But God sees an immense difference. It seems like it might have been easy for Titus to say, you know, you know, gosh, man, couldn't I be dropped off on a better island someplace where, where people are more interested in the Word, where, where that they don't argue with me, you know, where I don't have this great po problem with legalism, or, you know, I don't have this fight with the flesh, I don't, you know, I don't have to go through all this aggravation, you know, these are God's people. Titus is on the Isle of Crete for a purpose. God's people are there. These are the kinds of people to whom Titus has been sent by the Holy Spirit to minister the truth of the Word of God. Yeah, to minister the truth of His infinite grace, His infinite love, it just, it's got to be done. And folks, God could have done it any way that, that you know, you could imagine. You know, I suppose all things are possible with God. He didn't, he didn't need to use preachers. He could have struck Christians down like He did the Apostle Paul, he could have dealt with him through some angel, you know, Gabriel, Michael, you know, or somebody else, but it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. It seems to me that one of the marvelous ways for us to learn of the grace of God and the love of God is to minister to those kinds of people. If this were not the case, then it'd be, it'd be, it'd be really easy to become proud. To be like the Pharisee, you know, who prayed, you know, that, that, that I'm so glad I'm not like these others. And as I wade through all these verses, what I see is the Holy Spirit preparing Titus for a ministry to people who don't seem to, to be really all that interested in the things that Titus has to minister. And I am astounded because I'm looking at myself. I'm looking at my... I'm looking at my own life, folks, and I'm looking at yours. The purpose of the exhortation, the purpose of the convincing, the purpose of the sound doctrine is that they may be healthy in the faith. Well, we have to reach the conclusion then that being unhealthy in the things of the Lord is to be in the area of legalism, circumcision not giving heed to Jewish fables. What does it mean to be unhealthy? Giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. If, and that's a first class condition, since ye be dead, since ye died with Christ, because we did, why are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, 
all of that which perishes with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. We saw that in Colossians chapter 2. To be subject to these is to be unhealthy in the faith. Sound doctrine would be that which is contrary to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Now, here's where it gets a little rocky, okay? Am I suggesting that a Jewish fable is the Ten Commandments, the law of God? I mean, there's, there's congregations around this, this, this country, this world, I'm sure, who are being told week after week that many of the laws of God were, were not abrogated by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, kind of like a, a Mormon that I once knew who was a professor at, a, at, a, at, at, at his uh, school who actually taught uh, that through the, his, to his students through the book of Deuteronomy. That, that it, in fact, only the ceremonial law was really you know, taken care of. You're not under the ceremonial law, but, but you're, you're under the moral law. It's still in effect. And folks, that would suggest that Christ did not fulfill the law, which in fact he did. Law is law. Okay? A lot of Christians are confused on that point. They, they think, oh yeah, well, I understand, yeah, we died to the law. That's, that's a ceremonial law. That's not the moral law. Because I pick up my Bible and I read it and it says do it. That's law all the time failing to, 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 to see the picture that the Holy Spirit has painted, the portrait of Christ throughout these scriptures that's woven, interwoven all throughout scripture, which, in, which leads us to only one conclusion, one conclusion only. And that is that when we see all these do's and don'ts, what we are seeing is not law, but a lovely picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was absolutely solid on Mount Sinai is a Jewish fable today, folks, because it diminishes and blasphemes the finished work of Christ. What it suggests is that man is in some way capable of earning merit and favor with God. But man is not capable of earning merit or favor with God. To be unhealthy is to give heed to Jewish fables, to follow not only the law which was fulfilled by Christ, but hundreds of other provisions that had been added by Jewish elders. Okay? In con get this, in contrast to the elders that we see here in Titus, that Titus is to a point here. 400 volumes, folk. folk oh my gosh. It's. It, at least, I'll just say hundreds of volumes. I know it was at least 400. 400 volumes of legal minutia so engineered that properly executed money could be made from those who were forced to obey. To be unhealthy, folks, is to give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. And much of modern Christianity is based on Commandments of men. There are those who diligently study history to see how the church did it a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago. And there's some value in that, folks. I've, I, I myself am drawn to that. I think the importance is what, what does the word say? Not what men used to do, not what someone may consider to be biblical truth, but what this book says, what the Word of God declares, which, which in reality it is church history. We're looking at church history. The interesting thing in the 14th verse, the one who belongs to God, the one who is a child of God, who's led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, but never into Never does the Holy Spirit lead us into Jewish fables and commandments of men. And so we have a middle voice in the Greek, not giving heed, not paying attention to Jewish fables 
and commandments of men that turn themselves, middle voice, from the truth. In the grammar, that's what you see. Turn themselves from the truth. And so we have two powerful thoughts as we close the 14th verse. One is that they're not led by the Spirit in this. They are turning themselves. They are deluding themselves. And the direction in which they turn themselves is away from the truth. And that Jewish fables and commandments of men are not called truth. Truth is the Word of God. Oh, but Steve, are you saying that, that, that thou shalt not kill is not truth? Well, that, de that depends entirely on how that's applied. I shouldn't commit murder because the law in Oklahoma says I, I, sh I shouldn't commit murder. Not because the law of God says that, because I'm not under law. I'm under grace. And if you don't believe that you are under grace, then you put yourself back under law. You have turned yourself from the truth. In Galatians, the people there at Galatia were told that they had fallen from grace. Fallen from grace. And to fall from grace, folks, isn't to commit a sin. Falling from grace is to turn back to law. We need to understand the grace of God. It's the grace of God that makes a dramatic difference between David and Ahab. It's the grace of God that makes a dramatic difference between Jewish fables and commandments of men and truth. Through Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ, you put on the new man, which, is, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. To turn from that is to turn yourself. The Holy Spirit's not leading. The Holy Spirit deals in the new man not in the old. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. A couple of interesting words there. Unto the pure all things are pure. Well, the new creation is without sin. Whosoever is born of God cannot sin, for his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin. He has no power to sin. But unto them that are defiled, that's a, that's a perfect passive participle. Now I believe in verse 15, we're, we're suddenly filtering out those who are gods and those who are not. The perfect passive participle says that they have been defiled in past time and that the defiling The defiling was not them, okay? Now we're looking at a passive voice. They received that action. They're sons of the devil. It occurred in past time with a consummate result that it's eternally true. That defiled, uh, the word there, defiled, is an interesting word. It means dyed with another color. Dyed with another color. To stain with paint or dye. Figuratively, the word means to stain, defile the soul. Like, you know, when sin taints by its polluting effects. Moral, spiritual stains. Everything that, that passes through it becomes stained. Nothing's pure but even their mind and their conscience. Perfect passive indicative has been defiled completely in past time, with the result that it remains permanently defiled. Okay, that's what the text is saying. It was God who declared that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and that there would be enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. The serpent's seed. That has been defiled in past time. It will forever remain defiled. There isn't any possibility that there is any conversion there, that it, that'll, it'll become undefiled. But among those who contradict, some of whom give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who are unhealthy, can be made healthy. Why? Because they're God's children. But there are those 
in which no teaching, nothing you can do, not even sound doctrine, will lead to that healthy condition, is what the text is saying. Yet they profess to know God. That profess is a present active indicative. They are constantly declaring that they know God. The word know is oida, perfect knowledge. It happens to be in the perfect tense that they have always known God, that they perfectly know God. They have no problem saying that they know God. But in their works, they deny Him. That's a present tense. They are constantly denying Him by their works. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work of reprobate. Is it possible for, for someone to be redeemed and headed for heaven and show no evidence of that? I know that we can't see, folks, every aspect of another person's life, but the Holy Spirit can. To every good work reprobate. Do you realize how dogmatic a statement that that is? They may be a child of the devil and help pull your truck out of the mud, you know, when they've got their best clothes on. You know, the easiest thing to do would just would be to just drive on by, but they stop and they get all wet and they get all dirty helping, helping you out of the mud. So they're not reprobate unto every good work, right? Not what it says. Unto every good work reprobate. And I remind you that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. The worship of the wicked is sin. You know, can you look at every aspect of somebody's life and make that judgment? I can't. The Holy Spirit can, but can you? Or I? No, we can't. Is it right for, for a minister to say, you know, that guy gives no evidence at all whatsoever of being redeemed? Well, I've even, I'll admit, I've found myself doing that, and I, that's, that is so wrong. To make such a statement would, would, would lead me to believe that that I, I have to know every thought and action in that person's life, which I don't. You know, and all of us could have said that about Paul before his conversion. What we do is we judge outward appearances. I don't think God is asking us to judge here. I see the 16th verse used by some of my friends, by some pastors I know, as a measure of, as an ind indicator of redemption. And they look at that verse and they say, well, you know, there's a guy who's constantly saying that he knows God, but he's always disobedient and to every good work reprobate. Because I don't see no evidence of any conversion there. But in saying that, I think we ought to ask, well, have you ever seen every aspect of that person's life? And I think it's the Holy Spirit who's declaring here that when Titus looks at these Christians, these, guys, these people are a mess, folks. They contradict, they're disorderly, you know, they lie. And he's there to present sound doctrine, truth, and he's to ordain older men in the fellowship to do the same thing, who speak truth. And the purpose of that is so that, here's the purpose, so that God's elect among these Christians would become healthy. But will everyone become healthy? No. No. There are among them those who profess, constantly profess, that they have an intellectual relationship with God. They say they know God. You know, I've, I've talked to people who that, that seem to know more, uh, more than, than God. They know how He thinks, how He acts, what He does, they, you know, and they've gone far beyond what's revealed in this book. The Holy Spirit says that there are some that may be great professors who are in fact reprobate to every good work. And I reach the conclusion from these verses that it's only God, the Holy Spirit, it's only God Himself who knows those who are His and those who are not. I don't believe that this passage of Scripture is given for Titus to judge, but to comfort Titus, folk, listen, to comfort Titus in the proclamation of truth, knowing that some will not, cannot, never will ever hear. 
and so they'll, they'll not ever be made healthy. They may be professing vehemently that they're God's children and that they know Him, but it's not Titus's job to make that distinction. And it's comforting to me, folks, to realize in verse 13 that Titus is not commanded to make them healthy, but, he's, but, but it told that the presenting of the truth, the truth, doctrine, will, will, is what will make them healthy. You know, it'd be an easy thing for me to say, you know, I must not be preaching the Word right because, you know, people just aren't being made healthy. And I don't know that we're able to make that judgment. I don't think that you should be burdened by these passages of Scripture, but comforted. You know, because there's the truth that being faithful to the Word of God, recognizing that it, it is truth, and presenting that truth to the best of your ability will lead to healthy saints. You don't make them healthy. God's Word makes them healthy. Ministered by the Holy Spirit, taught by the Holy Spirit. The responsibility to Titus here is not making these folks healthy. And, and it's not discerning who's the elect and who's not, not elect. It is giving heed to the truth of the Word of God and faithfully presenting sound doctrine. And the result of that will then be a separation between those who are God's and those who are not. I think the end of the chapter is a comfort to those who teach this book, as well as a sharp sword to indicate that they should be teaching what the Word says. I have never suggested, folks, not once, that I can remember, you know, that I teach all truth. But I am telling you from the bottom of my heart, I want to. If I handle this book deceitfully, you, need to, you folks need to tell me. I spend hours looking at these words, trying to determine the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. And I'm not the least bit interested in a big following for my own personal sake. But I am interested in truth. And I believe that this passage of Scripture says that sound doctrine, allegiance to truth, will lead to healthy Christians in the separation between the elect and the non-elect. And so that ends the first chapter of the epistle to Titus. We'll pick up there uh, next time pick up next time on in chapter beginning with chapter two i love you all i truly do i want to particularly thank you all for your continued prayers for this ministry your continued support you know who you are until next time this is steve thanks for watching